first Métis were children of indigenous women and European fur traders in the Red River area, now known as Manitoba. It dates back to as early as 1973 during the Alexander Mackenzie expedition. The Métis people developed their own language called Michiv, which is a unique blend of French and the Cree language that is still used today. Roughly 33% of all Canada's Aboriginal population is Métis. Métis means mixed. The Métis Nation Blue Infinity Flag is the oldest continuous used flag in Canada and it represents the mixing of two cultures. Métis were often called flower beadwork people due to their combination of French floral embroidery mixed with Aboriginal porcupine quilt work. Métis are well known for their finger woven sash, which is referred to as l'assumption sash, and it is the most recognizable symbol of Métis heritage. A sash was often used as a belt, tow rope, tump line, or even as a sewing kit. They're made of wool. Louis Riel was a Canadian politician, a founder of the province of Manitoba, and a political leader of the Métis people. He led two resistance movements against the government of Canada and its first prime minister, John A. Macdonald. Riel sought to defend Métis rights and identity as the Northwest Territories came progressively under the Canadian sphere of influence. Louis Riel Day is on November 16. The Métis Nation of British Columbia was founded in 1996 and is still going strong today. All right, Maureen, uh, thank you for participating in the uh, Northeast BC uh, Métis Storytelling Project. Uh, this project is meant to share wisdom and teachings uh, from elders and it's so that future generations and other Métis citizens can come across this knowledge that perhaps somewhere in their path of life they haven't or maybe they just need to you know uh, do some reminiscing and get back into their culture so that they can hopefully maybe be part of their local Métis um, organizations okay so that being said uh, can you tell us uh, your full name please let's start with that Okay, my full name is Maureen Albright, uh, born in Vancouver area, North, North Vancouver area, um, married uh, in 64, moved here in 64. Okay. Uh, different, different completely from Vancouver, okay. completely. I enjoy it though, will not, I would never go back. There's <laughs> nothing back there for me anymore. That's fair. Now, yeah. that last name, the Albright, is that that's is that your married last yes. name? Yes. Okay. Yes. Before that, so before we got married, okay. what was your last name? My maiden, maiden name was Pearson. 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 Yes. Okay. Now, does the last name Pearson have um, Métis heritage? No. Uh, I've got three middle names. Okay. Whatever. Okay. My name is Maureen Marie Racine Pearson Albright. The Racine, there's your Métis. Ah. That was my, that was my, would have been my mother's maiden name. Okay, so the Métis heritage for you comes from your mother's? My mother's side. Okay. Yes, it would be her mother. And my grandfather is, was also Métis, but it was Ontario. Okay. Okay, he okay. was Mohawk and French, and my grandmother was Ojibwe and Scottish. Your grandmother? My grandmother, yes, apparently. Okay, gotcha. So, growing up, can you tell us a, a little bit about uh, what it was like for you to, uh, to grow up? Where, so, where you were born in Vancouver, you told us, right? I was born in the North, North Shore, on the north okay. side of Vancouver. And my dad was a steel worker in the Broad Dry Dock. He built, they built ships and stuff. Uh, when I was a youngster, I can remember my mom was an entertainer. She had her own radio state, radio program in Edmonton years ago when she was 12. Anyways, um, I went to school with uh, Chief Dan George's kids for years. My mom entertained with Chief Dan George to raise money to build a church. That's how I met the Dan. That would have been, I would have been maybe 10, 11 years old at that time. But basically, all my life, I have been raised with natives, kids. To me, the, uh, I'm not racist, I, and color means nothing. I raised a Negro girl when my, my children were little, oh, wow. you know, and it doesn't. So racism, which it beca is becoming very terrible 
it has been terrible for the natives for years, apparently. And uh, so uh, when I found out that I was Métis myself, I was pleased. I was really um, happy, I guess you would say. Yeah, so. Now, in growing up, um, did you have any nicknames growing up? Or did everybody call Well, you they just called me Mo because my name is spelt different, M-O-R-I-N-E. You were telling me about the yes. story. Tell me about the story about your name. Yes, my, uh, my name is Maureen, but it's not the M-A-U-R-E-E-N. It's M-O-R-I-N-E. -E. And my mom used to say, you don't pronounce it Maureen. You're supposed to be Maureen, the French version of Maureen, I guess. And that's how, I, I don't know, I, my, I've never run into anybody else with the spelling like that, you know. But. And did she tell you why she gave you that name? No, she never did. I don't know, uh, like she was, when her mom died when she was 11, and she was sent to McClellan, to the residential school in McClellan. And um, that's where she learned. The nuns taught her to sing and project, and that's how she, she was singing a mass in the church in McClellan at 12 years old. And there happened to be a gentleman in the, in the congregation that was from the origin, apparently there was an older radio station in Edmonton. And uh, he asked my mom if he figured she should go for an audition because of her voice. Now, her mom had died when she was 11, so she was sent there by her uncle. He paid for her to go. And uh, so he, 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 uh, she asked him, and he said, if you want to go, I'll take you to Edmonton. She went to Edmonton. She got the audition. She got the program. She became, um, now this would have been mid-30s, she was the name the program that she was called Texas Rose. They had a contest apparently one time as to the guess the age of Texas Rose. They had everything from eighty eight from eighteen to fifty. She was twelve. She was twelve. Yeah, and uh, you know, and so that that singing voice type of thing. This is why her and Chief Dan George. They got together and worked together to raise money for the building of the church, you know. So it worked out well. Then we had the band and, you know, the rest is history. Well, I'm still going to ask you about that. Yeah. But let's talk about uh, you growing up. Uh, so where did you do most of your growing up then? Uh, in, down in the south, in Vancouver, North Vancouver. I lived in Deep Cove. That's where it's called. And it was, uh, that's where I was raised most of the time. But we, we did a lot of did a lot of work with the Indians uh, because the road that we go to to get to deep, you have to go through a reserve, and that reserve was Dan George was the chief at that time. So we I got to, to be with them, and Mum would entertain, and I sang my first song at twelve, <laughs> <laughs> scared to death. But uh, yeah, so as a, as a kid, we were, it, it was different, you know, it was, uh, times were different then. It was like in the 50s and mid 50s, you know, and it was completely different life than what was here. And when I came here at first. How old were you when you came here? When I, when I got married, I was 21. I came here when I was 15 to Dawson Creek. I never came to Fort St. John, but I came to Dawson Creek. But did you come to visit or? Yeah, my, my dad was married before and he had five kids before me. And uh, so he came to, to visit my husband's father. My dad came up here in 28, 29 when it was hard times in Vancouver. He wasn't married, we were, he wasn't married then. But he uh, came up here because there was no work in Vancouver. And that's where he met my husband's father, Russell Albright. And he became like a brother to my dad. So when the Hart Highway opened up in 1952, 
we were one of the first, we crossed the Parsnip River on two by tens. The decking was sitting over there, but you run across on, on timbers. You know, they were, they, when we come back, the decking was on. I'll never forget that. Wow. But yeah. So that's, that's why we used to come up here, but I was like 14, 15. And I thought, there's nothing here compared to Vancouver. Yeah. There was nothing here in Dawson Creek. There was absolutely nothing. And then I ended up marrying and living in Dawson Creek and thoroughly enjoying the area. I, <laughs> I really, I really like the North in comparison, you know. Good. Um, now, school-wise, so did you do high school in or elementary and high school down in Deep Cove? Uh, we, we had, we had, we were bused into North Vancouver. Okay. Yeah, we had and that. I did that elementary, elementary in Deep Cove, and the uh, high school in North End. North End. Okay. Yeah. And then, did you um, go into the working force after that, or did you uh, keep going with school? I went into the workforce. I worked for the Navy for in Burrard Dry Dock, where they were building ships and so on. My dad was, he worked on, well, they called it the Rolls. At the time when I was there, they were building the uh, Yukon. It was a destroyer escort. And his job, he had, they called them the Rolls, and it looked like ringer washers, the old ringers, washers machines okay. with the yeah. ringers yeah. but they were 60 feet long and he could take a two inch piece of steel and his job was to bend that steel using the rolls to get the shape of the keel of the boat it was really something to see wow. it really yeah it was uh, I went when I was working down there they took us the women in the office we never got to see what we handled all the paperwork, but we never got to actually see the finished product of a boat. So uh, the uh, personnel manager took uh, all the women, or any men if they wanted to go, yep. from the office to go down and go through the, the Yukon before she was commissioned. And it was something. The, the doors, the, doors uh, the captain's door was made of teak, and all the window frames were teak. And uh, it started down in the belly, and there was six rows of engines. Now, I mean big cat engines or whatever. I guess they were cat engines. And they take you up layer by layer. One layer was, um, you've seen it in the war, where they have the boat. is It's a table, but it's glass, and there's lights underneath it. And say the boat is supposed to be in the middle and for 50 miles around that is that's where they would say uh, another boat was or a submarine or a destroyer and that boat would so they and this this thing kept moving as the boat as the boat supposedly kept moving these boats around this 50 mile would be changing wow. it was something to see it was really something to see and the part that really got me more than anything, right about in the middle of the boat, down close to the belly, was a little room, maybe a lot big as the, as the bathroom here, and all these tubes coming down, and there was this, the guy sat in the middle with a steering wheel, and all of these things come now. Apparently these things were from the bridge, and the, anything that was going on that they could see, he couldn't see it because he's down in the belly. And if they, when they would say turn 30 degrees, he did it. And I thought that is weird. And the <laughs> guy, poor guy never saw nothing. I mean, in the bridge, you'd see the daylight in the sky and the earth and you know, and the water, whatever. He saw nothing. And I thought that was really, really weird. But that was the p one part of my life that I wow. thoroughly enjoyed. Yeah. And so how long did you work there for? Four years, I guess it was. Yeah, four years. And then I come up here on a holiday. His, my, my future mother-in-law invited me in. Uh, while I was here, I got engaged. That was October. And we were not to be married until the following June. And I went back, back to work. And my husband went to work up in the Yukon. And we saw each other in April. And the minister that married us 
was a minister from here. He used to minister on horseback. He would swim the piece down by Clayhurst, and it, that's what he told us. I, that was, to me, was a shock. Yeah. That, uh, you know, and uh, when he found out where my husband was from, well, he just opened up and just started to talk. Yeah, <laughs> yeah so that was interesting. Yeah. Now, <clears throat> where would have your mom been during that time? At that time, uh, okay, during the, my mom and dad lived in Vancouver. Oh, so while your dad was working for uh, the Navy. Yeah, no, I was working for the Navy. Oh, okay. he, he was doing the building. He was like a, he was called, it was a boilermaker. Oh, okay, so gotcha. So okay. more for like a company. Yeah. Now, were your parents together? Oh, yeah. Back then? Okay. Oh, yeah. And uh, what did your mother do there? Did she look after the family? <laughs> I'm an only child. Okay. Okay. And while my, during that time when I was working at Burrard Dry Dock, my mom was sacking grain. They would bring uh, grain from wherever, Saskatchewan, whatever, and it was grain sent for export. So she was sacking grain for India or wherever. Um, Sometimes they'd get a boat, a boat in with with grain, and they want they they would need it bagged, and they would you'd take the grain off the boat, bag it, and put it back on the boat, so it's easier mm -hmm. for distribution. Mm -hmm. So she did that, and I worked in the shipyard, and my dad worked in the shipyard. Yeah, so <laughs> it was interesting life at that time. Now, and back then, did your mom share any? Like Métis, um, like traditions or any, uh, I guess, anything along those lines with you? You see, at the time, at the time, uh, I didn't realize at the time or even before that, Natives couldn't even vote. They couldn't vote until 1948. To me, that's disgusting, but that's the way it was then. Um, as far as we were involved with so much with Indians that mother never, you know, as because her mom died when she was 11. Mm. And the pictures that I've got of my grandmother, she's native, she's, she was Ojibwe, you know. But as far as having uh, native um, heritage, no, at that time, no. There was, mother felt very comfortable working with Dan and working with the Indians. She felt very comfortable, and it made, as a kid, this was just part of life. You just enjoyed whatever boat race. We went to boat ra canoe races, canoe races, and they were uh, the Burrard, the Burrard uh, number one was hand carved out of a log. It was beautiful. It was eleven man, ten paddlers, and one. I don't know what you call him, the guy that tells him when to hoof, oh, hoof, whatever. Yeah, yeah. and um, I can remember as a kid, we, they used to have uh, boat mm. races. And it was in Lummi Island, which Lummi is just out of Bellingham, close to the water. Mm. And they'd have, the Indians would have a, a, a weekend of boat races. Now it would be single, doubles, the 10 man, and they do, they do singles and they do the tip over. You'd go so far and the bell would go and the guy had to tip the boat over and then get back in it and start to paddle again. <laughs> you know, I can remember doing that and then they would, they would have pick their princess. They would nominate a, a girl. They would have children from schools singing, a choir, beautiful children's voices. To, and it was all natives, the whole thing. It was wow. the, the dance and whatever. And you guys used to go with your family? Oh, every year, every year. My mom would always uh, bless the boats before they would leave. They wanted my mom to put her hand on it and do the, <laughs> do the thing, you know? Do yeah. That's really nice. Yeah, but as far as being, it, you know, learning any of the, I didn't even know I was Métis until a couple, three years ago, you know? You were telling that earlier on. Now. While you were here, though, so you you know you moved up here. Yeah. Did you encounter anyone, or did you meet anyone that uh, was First Nations? And did you know what well, once you were living here in the north, and did you have any experiences with that up here? Well, I had my own business, uh, and I hired three of my girls were in were were natives. 
they were, uh, one girl had been in a residential school. They had pulled her from her family. And Florence used to tell me about the day that they come and got her, you know, and that she was given a beating if she spoke Cree. She could not speak Cree. They were trying to force the language out of them. The other two, one was, uh, the other girl was much younger though, and she never spoke about it at all. But Florence, the, and now when they tell the stories now about the residential schools, I, the stories that she told me of what happened to her, it's exactly what these ladies and gentlemen are saying about that they, what they can remember, you know? Sad, really, really sad, I think, anyways. Yeah, that is too bad. Yeah. So, <clears throat> you finally got married. Yeah. And then, did you guys have children? Yes, I have two girls. Two girls? Yeah, two girls. One is living in Rose Prairie, which is just not far from here. Uh, she's a licensed hairdresser. She's also raising cows and horses. Her youngest son is fifth in Canada for roping. Now, my youngest daughter is a head nurse in the University of Alberta Hospital. She works in the hematology lab at this point. She was working in uh, Fort Saskatchewan, but her hours were horrendous and she was getting burnt out big time. So she tried, thought she maybe get away from that for a little while, you know, because it was, she, she was getting burnt out. It was just 12 to 14 hour days and day after day after day, you know, and it was tough, really, really tough. Yeah, so it's easier now. Oh, good. A little easier. <laughs> Still hard, but a little easier, you know. <laughs> Good. Yeah. Um, now, who would you say growing up um, was the person that maybe influenced you the most or that maybe you looked up to? Hmm. Do you mean member of my family or do Could you mean anyone anybody? else too? Yeah. Well, you know, the one I can remember as a child is, is, uh, is Dan, is Chief Dan George. I, I can remember him. He was such a kind man he had lots of children lots of children <laughs> his oldest son had 13 and dan himself i think he had nine i think it was nine and my mom my mom uh they were trying to uh the the women of the reserve at that time were trying to uh, bead learning how to bead well when she went to mcclellan school the nuns taught her how to bead, so my mom taught Amy, which was Dan's wife, taught Amy and these ladies how to bead correctly, so that when if the bead breaks, the whole thing doesn't come apart. There's a trick, and the, they have done such beautiful work, vests and gauntlet gloves and just gorgeous. The stuff that I saw before I left, you know, just beautiful. So. I would say Dan, he, he uh, I, can, I can remember so many things, you know, because he was, he was very kind and very, um, how would I put this, a lot of prophecies. He was that type of a person. He would tell you a story as, as a child, mm -hmm. you know, he would tell a story. And he was very uh, thinking ahead predicting ahead, not predicting, as much as visualizing what he thought was going to happen, you know, and trying to protect his family and his people against it, you know, but uh, for me, that was, it, I would say Dan, really, as, as, as I say, as a child, because I, I grew up with his kids, you know, yeah. became very, yeah, so. Did your mom tell you, um, I guess, stories about your, you know, your grandma and, and the, the Métis well, uh, she, she told me, see, my mom was, um, I asked my grandfather, uh, uh, oh, I guess about four years before he passed, if we had any Indian blood. Now, this was a while back, yep. before I realized that, yes, I do yep. have Indian blood. And I asked him, and he said, no way. But when you stop and think, of how the Indians were treated. You hid the point that you were Métis. You didn't tell anybody that you were Indian of any sort 
because of the repercussions. And so as far as learning, uh, my, my mom, uh, her mom died when she was 11. She's buried in Dawson Creek because my grandfather was working on the construction of the railroad mm -hmm. and she cooked for the, for the boys, you know. But uh, for my mom, it, it seemed very comforting to her to, you know, it was just like she knew that she was part native, you know, but, but my grandfather insisted there was no Indian blood in us at all, you know. <laughs> but I mean, yeah, I mean, once you put it into that context and that perspective that, you know, it basically had all these repercussions, right. it's, exactly. it's a whole different story to then say, really, oh yes, you know, I'm First Nations or I'm Métis of any kind, knowing what you may face going forward. Yeah, you know, and it, it's really sad. I mean, you see that in, because your color of skin is different, to me, like the, in the States with the Negroes and, and, and the Jewish people and Indian people, to me, this is horrendous. This is, you peel that skin off and underneath, we bleed the same, we look the same. But because you're more tan than I am, what a crock. You know, just just makes me angry. Yeah. Anyways, <laughs> on to something else. <laughs> That's definitely not right. Um, okay, well, why don't we, like in your case, I, maybe I want to fast forward a bit more because you said that about three years ago then, you found out yeah. that um, you had, um, I guess, first, or Métis specifically, yeah. heritage yeah. Yeah. in your yeah. uh, blood. Now, can you tell me how you came about finding that out? Okay, um, in 1993, uh, there was a family reunion for the Racine family, and it was held in Ontario. And we went to a little town uh, 30 miles north of Montreal at St. Anne de Plain. Now, when we got there, uh, the Racine family had, they had traced it back to 1700 and something. And it was four boys from Normandy, France, came across the Atlantic, come down the St. Lawrence, landed at a small town called Beaupre, and from there they split. Uh, there was no American and U.S. border at that time. And uh, they married. Well, the only women that were around, apparently, at that time were Mohawk. So they, they know that the, the, the one boy, his name was Pierre, apparently, mm -hmm. he married a, a Mohawk Indian woman. And from that, that's where my grandfather come. My grandmother, now that's a different story. Um, my granddaughter was looking for educational subsidies to help her go to university. And she had asked me, if we had any Indian blood, and I told her about my grandfather. Well, she said, we need to go to the Red River. The base, basis has to be out of the Red River. She said, what about your grandmother? So I said, I told her all, all I knew, her name and where she was born. Anne Shano, born out of Duhamel, Alberta. She took that name. Two weeks later, she called me and asked me if I knew of a man called Cuthbert Grant, and I, which I didn't. He was the sheriff and the magistrate at the Red River. And a week after that, she phoned me back again. She asked me if I'd ever heard of uh, Louis Riel, and I said yes. Uh, well, she said he was the nephew of Cuthbert Grant. So that's how we found out that we're Métis. Apparently my grandmother is Ojibwe and Scottish, I believe, from what I understand. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That really goes back quite a bit. Quite a ways. Oh, yes. But yet for so long, you know, you weren't even basically aware of it. I had no idea. I had no, for myself, I had no idea that I was, had Indian blood in me until I found out, well, for sure in 93 with my grandfather and now with my grandmother also. And I look, there's pictures taken of my grandmother cooking. Uh, she had, they had uh, like camps on rails that they cooked for the guys mm -hmm. and you t the pictures I've got of her she's very much native very much <laughs> dark-haired and got that same look you know so 
if I if I didn't know had pictures of her, I hadn't seen pictures of her, but I can tell now that she was very much native. Yes. And so, since you found out, did you so you, you joined the the Métis Society? Well, Jacqueline here at the Fort St. John Métis, she's the one that helped us get. We had to bring our long birth certificates, which give you the mother and father's, the mother's maiden name and where she was born and the father's name or whatever, and that started it. Because once we found out that there was Indian blood, that to be to actually verify, like and um, so that's how we found out that yes, there was native blood from my grandmother's side. My mom's mom, yeah. And since that time, so, um, and once it was all verified, um, have you participated in any uh, Métis uh, Society like events or any, anything? Oh, well, I was the woman's rep. I, Jacqueline, uh, uh, they appointed me as woman's rep and I went down to Vancouver and went to some AGMs down there and met a lot of people, you know, down there. And I've thoroughly enjoyed it. I really, of course, I'm retired now. You know, and but I thoroughly enjoyed it. I, Jacqueline is a nice lady, very nice <laughs> to deal with. You know, she's a she's a easy easy to deal with. You know, very obliging. Yes, that's nice. And over the years, um, would you say that um, you have any like faith or spiritual part of your life um, at all? If I had years? what? Do you have any faith or any spiritual to help you? Uh, deal with like tough times or how would you say you dealt with uh, tough times? Well, to be honest, I was raised Catholic. Mm -hmm. My mom was strong RC from way back. Mm -hmm. And when I was a child, there was no church in Deep Cove at all. And they had missionaries that would travel and they were nuns that were, that were traveling around at that time in the habits down to the ground, you know. Found out later on that I had a cousin had a cousin that was a nun. She did missionary work in Africa, you know. Wow. Um, yeah, working with lepers and whatever. Yeah, but now I, for myself, really, I was, as I say, I was raised Catholic, okay. you know. And did that continue on in your life? Well, not when I got here because it was there. The uh, Jack is not Catholic, so I kind of just played it cool. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Yeah, so, no, be at my, I sent my children to the Notre Dame in Dawson Creek because oh. they got, and that, and when they, when my oldest daughter started there, the nuns were still teaching oh. in the habits, the whole ball of wax, you know, and uh, they were given better personal, personal stuff. Yes. They were, you know, smaller classes, and it was, uh, they were very good to her, you know, very strict. Sometimes that was what was needed. <laughs> yeah, I mean, sometimes when you're growing up, that's yeah, just that's what right. you need. Yeah. Um, okay, well then I'll leave it off with one last thing then. Um, for anyone that um, perhaps, um, you know, watches later on, or anyone that's of Métis heritage, what message would you want to pass on to anyone that will watch us in the future? Do you mean for the future of the Fort St. John Métis Society? Or just for the Métis uh, people themselves? Be proud of who you are. You know, don't let this racism get to you. You know, just, as I say, be proud of who you are and what you are and what your family is and your upbringing. You know, because if we don't recognize it, it's going to disappear. And with, uh, of course, I have, uh, I'm a great grandma now, I, and the little one, she's a little too small yet. But my other, my other grandchildren, they are, there's a lot, there's a lot of morals has been taught to them. They are, my one granddaughter was the youth rep for Fort St. John Métis. And, but they should remember, remember their heritage and be proud. Be proud of who they are. That's my personal opinion. I am, and you know, and if people don't like because they, I'm, I'm an Indian, that's their problem, not mine. <laughs>
a beautiful message and yeah. well put. Yes, <laughs> yes. Well, thank you, uh, Maureen, for sharing all the stories and all that knowledge. And we certainly appreciate you being part of this project. Thank you very much. Thank you.